I, I brought together some different topics. Uh, the, the start for this whole uh, paper was uh, uh, an evening that I organized at the center here in Frankfurt around uh, animal theology. And there was an uh, agricultural engineer and an animal theologian who discussed uh, if we can uh, use animals the way we do uh, up till now, that we slaughter them, that we eat them, that we use them uh, for uh, medical uh, experiments, uh, for military experiments. Uh, and uh, I was thinking, um, uh, and they, they are convinced uh, vegan people, very committed people, activists also here in the city, uh, and this was the start for my uh, reflection. Uh, I am not a vegan myself. Uh, I uh, try to uh, live consciously, but I still eat uh, meat. Uh, but I thought it would be interesting to, uh, to reflect from this perspective and, and to see what, uh, what Merton has to say about that. And, I t uh, and then I came up with this... Uh, this uh, concept or this experience or this contemplative approach of natural contemplation, which was very important for Merton. I will say a little bit more about that. And then I wanted to bring it back to Europe, so to speak, uh, to Paris uh, and to pastoral theology, because I'm a pastoral theologian. And I was, uh, my idea was to bring Merton then in, into dialogue with two uh, pastoral theologians who were active in Paris and lived in the same time uh, as Merton. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, they didn't know each other, but uh, Merton was very familiar with his Paris uh, Orthodox uh, circle of theologians. Uh, so indirectly, he was, you could say, in, in dialogue with them. So this is, it started from one evening uh, at the center where I work, and then I uh, went uh, through natural contemplation and I ended up with pastoral theology. Let's see how it goes today within uh, 20 minutes, uh, but I will uh, give you a short of, uh, overview of my thoughts. I have uh, written uh, them down uh, and I hope to uh, publish a book also in uh, next year on uh, Thomas Merton as a pastoral practitioner and Thomas Merton and uh, pastoral uh, uh, practice. So this is part of, of my reflections there. So why do we look at people from the past? Why do we look at somebody like Merton, uh, who lived uh, many years ago? And what, then, what can we take from that? As a practical theologian, I, I, I'm not a historian. I don't want to uh, understand what he said only, uh, what he said then. But I also want to find out what I can learn from it for today. Uh, for my life, for my professional uh, work. So, uh, and uh, Merton was reflecting on that too, because he was interested in uh, people from the past. Uh, I, he was living uh, in the past, the present and the future at the same time. Uh, there is uh, this famous uh, quote in Day of the Stranger that he is surrounded by voices from uh, thousands of years ago, but also uh, people that he is friends with. Uh, and uh, he somehow has the philosophy that it is good to be in conversation with all kinds of people dead or alive uh, and uh, to learn from them, to be in dialogue with them, to open your perspective. Uh, and for, his, for him as a monk, that was a very important part also to be related to the world. But he had the kind of a uh, very broad view uh, that started with uh, with the Bible and then uh, the patristic, the Desert Fathers, and so on and so on, medieval mystical theology. So he was in conversation with all these voices at the same time. But he says we cannot stick to them just like that. We have to bring them uh, to our time and day and see what we can learn from them. Uh, the first figure that I want to focus on is Maximus the Confessor, uh, and Merton was teaching uh, about him uh, in the 50s and in the 60s. And I uh, reflect on Maximus the Confessor as one uh, voice that Merton was listening to, because he, uh, Maximus was reflecting on this famous, very famous three stages of the spiritual life. Uh, that was based again on Evaglius Ponticus, who was uh, very closely related to the Desert Fathers. Uh, Maximus lived in the, uh, the 6th and the 7th century, and uh, that was a, 
a century of turmoil uh, within uh, the Christian um, environment, but also in relationship to Islam uh, and to Judaism. This is a, a talk as such, but I'm uh, going to focus on this one uh, scheme that he uh, developed and reflected on. And he said, you know, uh, if you think about contemplative life, spiritual life, it is good to start with the active life. We all in society have to live a virtuous life and uh, we cannot just follow our, uh, our uh, unconscious um, um, impulses. We have to develop virtues. And this is the start for uh, also for a, a religious life, a life of faith. And then uh, you can decide uh, to step out of the, uh, the active life uh, and to become a monk or to become um, uh, a religious person. And then uh, with God's grace, uh, you can also contemplate nature. And this is a, a second step on the stage of uh, mystical life. Uh, and it is about uh, to look at nature, creation, animals uh, from a God's perspective. Uh, from uh, um, as if uh, God would look at creation and try to understand how God looks at creation. And uh, it has some active uh, element in it, but it is also uh, a grace. It's a mystical experience to relate to animals, to creation uh, that, uh, that is surrounding us. And then theology uh, is the mystical experience where you uh, the, the highlight of the mystical experience uh, where you somehow uh, surpass the world and return to it as a transformed person. So Maximus was saying that um, lay people uh, can also have uh, the highest level of theologic, uh, of mystical experience, the so-called theology, but they cannot have natural contemplation which is kind of strange. He was saying that only monks can really relate uh, in a contemplative way uh, to nature and to creation. So uh, this is the basic uh, idea and let's see uh, what uh, Merton did uh, with that. Um, to bring it to the 20th century and to the life of Merton, uh, you have to understand uh, that he was in the 60s interested in uh, animal theology and in creation. Uh, Monica Weiss has written beautiful things about that uh, in her uh, book on the environmental vision of uh, Thomas Merton. And in one of her articles, she refers to a statement that he did on uh, factory farming, uh, which he compared to barbarism. <laughs> Uh, so uh, you can say, uh, how does a, a monk like Merton who lived in the 60s, how does he relate to uh, a monk who lived in the 6th and the 17th, uh, 7th century, uh, who was reflecting on natural contemplation and relating to... Uh, and So Merton lives in a totally different context with, with different attitudes, with different uh, feelings uh, towards creation uh, and uh, different accents. Uh, and so... Uh, but still he is able to bring this old monk from many centuries ago into conversation with him. Uh, in the 50s, uh, he was still uh, not totally ready to open up to the world. Merton, he was on his way uh, and he was reading orthodox theologians who were uh, reflecting on Maximus the Confessor. Uh, he was also reading uh, a German uh, theologian, uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar, uh, who has ri had written a beautiful uh, uh, book on uh, Maximus. And in the 50s, when he was uh, a master of scholastics, it's the first time that he was teaching uh, this, uh, his... Uh, uh, his co uh, the monks that uh, the young monks uh, and uh, it was the first time that he was talking about Maximus. You can see here that he has not given up this idea that uh, natural contemplation is mostly something for monks, not really for people who are active in the world. So he opened uh, the way he was living himself and his view of the world was still uh, negative and uh, this also gave him like a uh, a perspective, uh, the way uh, he was interpreting Maximus the Confessor. So he stresses that uh, natural contemplation is like a, a, a kind of liturgy uh, and it's like being a, a high priest of uh, creation. And he uh, writes or he teaches then in, uh, in uh, his lectures on the sanctity and the epistles of St. Paul, 
He has four pages on, on uh, Maximus, and he teaches that only the uh, ideal Christian is able uh, to, uh, to do natural contemplation. And he refers to, uh, in Bread in the Wilderness, that was written in the same time, he refers to David as a kind of uh, ideal uh, faith person in the Bible who was able to look at uh, creation and animals uh, from a, a, a godly uh, perspective. But you have to be like an ideal person to do that. So not very interesting for me yet as a practical theologian who want to involve as many people as possible with uh, in uh, ecological issues. And then we move on to the 60s uh, where he uh, gave his course on uh, introduction to Christian mysticism. He was a master of novices by that time. He opened up to the world. Uh, he was starting to interest it in peace issues, ecological issues and so on. Uh, and uh, he uh, had a kind of combination, I would uh, describe Merton always as a contemplative person and also a prophetic person. Uh, and this makes him interesting for us also today. And this uh, angle gives him also a new interpretation uh, of uh, Maximus. So uh, not only the logoi, the way that God looks at uh, creation and animals, they, uh, in the Greek tradition they call it the logoi, uh, you have to find out how, uh, how that looks like, but also tropoi, how uh, animals behave. They can uh, be uh, a motivation for actions in the world. And you can see that this, uh, this hierarchy between active life, contemplative life and theology, he somehow uh, destroys it and brings it all together. It's not a hierarchy anymore and it is open for everybody and natural contemplation is for everybody and it is related to our actions in the world. And animals can also teach us how to be prophetic in the world and animals can also teach us how to uh, deepen our, our contemplative life. He brings it also, uh, this topic of Maximus Confessor in uh, his interreligious dialogue. I refer to Abdil As uh, Abdul Aziz, uh, who uh, he was writing to, who was uh, uh, a person from Pakistan who was uh, interested in uh, interreligious dialogue and Christian mysticism. Uh, they got into contact uh, with each other through uh, Louis Massignon. Uh, and uh, he brings in this topic of uh, natural contemplation. This could be interesting. So it is typical for Merton that he brings in some figures from the past or the present in his dialogue with, with people from other religions too. And uh, Abdulaziz is an example. So what did uh, Merton do with Maximus Confessor in the 60s? He said that natural contemplation has to do with everyday life, with everyday seeing. It has to do with prophet being prophetic. Uh, and there is a famous quote, uh, he was already uh, living in the Hermitage, uh, where he sees the deer uh, and uh, where uh, he has the, uh, the uh, uh, he wants to touch this deer. So it is really related to his senses, uh, to his physical uh, being uh, in the Hermitage. It is not being afraid of the world anymore, being afraid of other people, uh, something exclusive, natural contemplation. It is open to all. And maybe the so-called primitive people are more open to this kind of uh, contemplation that we, than we as Christians who live in a technological uh, society. So he turned it somehow, uh, instead of a pyramid, it became a circle. Uh, everywhere uh, you, uh, you can experience God, uh, and it, and uh, being related to God and to creation is not uh, in opposite to being related to the world. He looks at the world, of course, critically, but he also loves the world. And he is convinced uh, that uh, we can uh, discover God and also in relationship to creation, we can learn from creation how to be better human beings. Let's go, uh, this is my first part of the talk. Uh, now I bring him into dialogue uh, with two people, two uh, pastoral theologians that he didn't know, but who, who worked in Paris. Uh, and Merton was very interested in what was going on in Paris uh, in Orthodox uh, circles. And Cyprian Ken was a, a, a professor there uh, in uh, St. Sergius in Paris. Uh, he died in 1960. Uh, Merton didn't know him, uh, I guess, because he was mostly uh, writing in Russian, 
uh, and not many of his texts uh, were translated. Just a few were uh, translated into French uh, by the uh, uh, monks of uh, Chevetonia in Belgium, but not much was available. Uh, but Cipion Ken has written a very nice uh, booklet on a classic within Orthodox tradition on pastoral theology. And uh, interesting for Orthodox pastoral theologians is that they also delve into the tradition and he also goes to Maximus the Confessor to teach chaplains, pastoral ministers, how they should relate to the world. And he says uh, that it is important uh, that we don't uh, think uh, as chaplains, as pastoral practitioners, that we are divided from the world, that we have to live just an ascetic life uh, and uh, be puritanists and be afraid of other people. Uh, so he takes away also from Maximus this idea uh, that uh, we relate to the whole creation and that we almost have a cosmological perspective. We should have a cosmological perspective if we think uh, uh, about our work in the parish, in the hospital, uh, in, uh, in the ministry that, uh, ministry that we do. Uh, and you can see uh, that uh, this idea is very close to what uh, Merton uh, was saying in his, uh, in his course on, uh, on mysticism in, in uh, the 60s. And I treat also Merton really as a, as a pastoral theologian because he was a, a spiritual director, he was a teacher, he was in correspondence with letters, and this is something that is close to what I also do in my professional life. Uh, Cyprian Kern uh, wrote, uh, so he brings uh, this idea of natural contemplation also into contact with the prophetic, uh, the same as Merton did. Uh, and uh, this uh, is a quote from uh, a very famous article, uh, Michael Pleken published it, uh, uh, and who is also uh, a member of our community here. Uh, and uh, it was written in 1937. Uh, so uh, we, you have to imagine this is Europe, uh, Nazism is coming up, uh, nationalism is coming up. Uh, and he asked himself as a, a minister, how should I relate to the world? It's a similar question that Bonhoeffer also was asking. Uh, and he was saying that, that there is a, like a, a Levitical approach to the world uh, and there is a prophetic approach to the world. The Levite uh, will only focus on the uh, liturgy, uh, will look down on the world, will look down on creation uh, and will not uh, be a prophet in the world. Uh, and Kern already in 37 uh, was thinking about uh, how can I be prophetic and contemplative at the same time. And he made a difference between the pastor as a Levite and the pastor or the, uh, the minister as a prophet. Again, very close to what Merton was doing in, uh, in the 70s, in the 60s. Still thinking about liturgy but, uh, and natural contemplation, a contemplative life, but at the same time, how to be a prophet. And again, very close, Cyprian Kern and Thomas Merton come very close here. Um, and then uh, uh, Merton said um, um, that the same as Cyprian Kern, and this is very close to our today's world, if you're a, a racist, if you're a nationalist, uh, if you look down on other uh, ethnicities and people, uh, if you have a very conservative view of, uh, of being a Christian uh, that is only related to following liturgy, then the chances are also very big uh, that uh, you don't like climate change, that you don't uh, believe in it, uh, that you are critical uh, about it, uh, that you don't believe in natural sciences. So Cyprian Kern and Thomas Merton uh, criticize a kind of worldview where all these elements come together, uh, racism, nationalism, uh, looking down on other people and don't believing in climate change. So it, it is a kind of bringing this all together uh, and this is what we uh, which, I, which I reflect on uh, in my daily work because I also have to do uh, with people who are more on this conservative uh, angle of uh, Catholicism and I notice that all these things come together. Uh, nationalism, focus on liturgy and not believing in anything that has to do with, uh, with uh, ecology. And um, so this is again where Cyprian Kern and Thomas Merton come very close. I leave uh, this figure and I go to Elizabeth Bersigel, uh, 
who was a French uh, ecumenical uh, theologian. Uh, she grew up as a Protestant and then became uh, an Orthodox. Uh, she studied Protestant theology and worked uh, as, a, as a minister for a few years and then became Orthodox uh, by, uh, because uh, she went to uh, uh, the Institute Saint Sergio. Uh, and uh, she was also a teacher and a professor there in the 80s uh, on uh, ascetical theology. And she also believes if we look at today's world, we have to go back to the tradition. So she also reflects on Maximus the Confessor and brings it uh, to uh, our day's world. And uh, one of the disadvantages of this classic idea of natural contemplation and theology, this hierarchy, is that it is only for monks. And uh, she questions that, the same as Merton did. Is this natural contemplation and theology only for monks and priests? Is this uh, only for men? Uh, what about women? What about lay people? So if we want to reflect on natural contemplation in our today's world, we have to reflect on issues also of gender, uh, of the relationship between uh, monks, priests and uh, lay people. If we don't do that, we will not understand um, uh, natural contemplation in, in a good way. Uh, so she starts from the general, uh, the, the priests of, uh, of all the faithful, very close to also the idea of the Second Vatican Council, that we are all priests of creation, uh, and that uh, the, uh, the, the priest who, who, is, um, who has this as a vocation is not ontologically different from us. She also um, argued with uh, Maximus, and this is very interesting, that uh, also women should uh, be able to become priests within the Orthodox tradition, uh, based on uh, Galatian, uh, where uh, Maximus uh, also uh, says that the difference between man and woman, slave and Greek, uh, disappears. Uh, so how can we argue, looking from Jesus Christ, that only men can become priests? So uh, men and women can become priests. We are all priests of creation. And from that perspective, we can contemplate nature. It is open to all of us. And this is again very close uh, to what uh, Merton said, uh, that uh, we have to get rid of this idea that there are two classes of people, um, uh, lay people and, and, uh, and priests, uh, and that we have to relate to our bodies uh, that we are, have to relate to our senses, uh, that uh, pe uh, priests should also be able to get married. And all these elements uh, uh, bring together in today's uh, brought together in today's context, help us to reinterpret uh, an old guy like Maximus the Confessor and how he thinks uh, about uh, natural uh, contemplation. And I conclude uh, with uh, a quote from Be uh, Sigel, that we are maybe living in a time of fear and traveling, but uh, based on our faith, uh, we uh, believe that there is hope and desire for ultimate transfiguration of humanity and the entire cosmos, which is characteristic of Eastern spirituality. And that was a spirituality that was very dear uh, and close to uh, Thomas Merton. <laughs>